So let's move on to the final speaker. Uh, final speaker is uh, Professor Izumi Ozawa uh, from Osaka University. And uh, Professor Ozawa uh, is going to talk about neural basis of fine visual discrimination. Uh, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm the last speaker, and, and the last speaker holding you back. Uh, so I try to be painless. OK, so my team um, consists of these uh, faculty collaborators. But uh, uh, there are ma many top topics that uh, we are doing. But uh, I'll be focusing on the last uh, two, five and six, uh, stereo and uh, gain control and fading. And those two things will come up in order. I'll, I'll try to take you through the uh, uh, experiment and data. So um, these are the two points. Uh, factors affecting fine stimulus discrimination. You know, the uh, ability to discriminate stimuli in the end will, will be very important for uh, system perception. And uh, neurons are the basis of that. And when you talk about uh, discrimination, uh, there are two factors. One is uh, sharpness to tuning. And I agree, completely agree with uh, Gabriel uh, about, uh, you know, sometimes you, you can't really uh, label the axis. Here, uh, I'm mainly working in V1, so uh, we can still uh, label the axis, for example, spatial frequency and so on. So here, we have sharp tuning and broad tuning for the ability to discriminate stimuli of course, uh, it's better to have a sharp tuning uh, where we can use this slope section uh, where a small change in the stimulus parameter will cause large change in, in the response. And uh, that's one factor. I, I don't claim t these two, two to be the only ones. There are probably many other factors. But the other one that uh, uh, we dealt with was the dynamic range of spiking responses. I mean, spiking re responses stochastic but in addition to that, it's very limited in, in the range. <laughs> Typical neurons can't really fire more than uh, three sp 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 spikes per second. It depends on um, the area like, uh, or the function. Like some of the oculomotor neurons uh, can fire many more than that, but it's basically like two log units you know, from three spikes to uh, 300 spikes. So uh, you, ha you have to compress the... Uh, the range of uh, stimuli into that uh, two, two log unit of uh, change. But uh, let's first uh, deal with the uh, first one. Uh, this is mainly the work of uh, uh, Kota Sasaki and uh, Daisuke Kato and Mikababa. Okay. So uh, let's start with uh, these. Uh, these are the uh, really a small sub subset of uh, simple cell receptive fields taken from cats uh, over the years. And uh, this is just a small subset, for, uh, you know, orientation-tuned uh, GABO-like uh, receptive fields. Uh, these are the uh, first uh, layer of uh, uh, CNN, uh, as you know. And uh, this is a starting point. And uh, so uh, those simple cells are modeled with the linear receptive field, mainly like just GABO functions, and going through uh, static nonlinearity and then spiking a generator. And uh, combining those uh, simple cells, uh, usually for minimum of four uh, subunit, if you do computationally, you can uh, get away with uh, two units of uh, even and odd uh, symmetric couple uh, functions. And then uh, uh, do uh, full wave rectification and squaring and add the two. And that's the simplest model of a complex cell. Now, if you extend this to, uh, to not, not, not to binocular case, it's, it's it just um, add you know, left eye, right eye. I mean, it, previously it was just one eye, but uh, we have two eyes uh, linearly converging onto a simple cell and then squaring. And it's, it's so, so essentially, it's the same model. And that organization will give you this kind of uh, setup where the cat is looking at in front. And then, then you have a, a three-dimensional GABO function which is the, uh, the binocular, you know, three-dimensional receptive field of, uh, of this particular uh, complex cell. Now, we can measure this. 
receptive field, three-dimensional receptive field, and take a cross-section, horizontal cross-section through it uh, by using these stimuli. And I don't go into the detail, but uh, you know, uh, just uh, that uh, uh, please uh, believe me that you can measure this thing. By the way, this is not uh, a stereo random dot, dynam dynamic ron random dot stereogram. It's just a left light, right that is stimuli are completely uncorrelated, just independent random dots uh, generated uh, frame by frame. Okay, we can extract uh, this kind of receptive field structure. And that's, that's sort, of, sort of an old study. Now, but uh, <coughs> we encountered um, the discrepancy between the prediction of that, that disparity energy model and what actual real neurons do. And that's the prediction from a disp disparity energy model. As you notice here, the envelope of this um, left-right right, uh, right, uh, interaction map is circular in the envelope, but the real neuron is very elong elongated along the diagonal, which is um, very unusual. And then uh, this, uh, the depth axis goes this way from bottom right to, to top left as you go from near to far. Okay, so it's very elongated. And uh, we wondered about it and uh, we uh, thought uh, some, something must be done to fix this disparity in energy model disc, uh, in, in <coughs> insufficiency. So uh, what we did was to, um, you know, following the AI lead of uh, co uh, CNN, uh, we tried pooling. A complex cell usually is already pooling, okay, simple cells. But uh, we pool complex cell again to generate a wider receptive field, something like that. But uh, you know, molecularly, it doesn't do anything. If you put, put a single complex cell, measure spatial frequency tuning, it gets, you get this. And then if you just uh, pool many of those, and then you get exactly the same kind of uh, tuning, and it doesn't improve any tuning at all. But in, the, in studying this uh, binocular thing, we thought that uh, be, since we are neurophysiologists, neurophysi we should pool in V1 space. What I mean by that is in usual CNN, it, it only does spatial pooling, uh, get filter output from many different locations, and then generate a single output. But in this case, in V1, because it's um, structured like this, this is showing orientation columns. And if you just uh, take a chunk of cortex and then throw um, responses of those, those neurons, all of those, into a single one, then you have to do it in four-dimensional you know, uh, hyperspace. So XY position, as well as spatial frequency orientation. So I represent that uh, pooling area by a sphere uh, converging onto one. So that, that's the concept of uh, V1 pooling. Now, <clears throat> in order to uh, <clears throat> give you an example, uh, what, do you, what do I mean by pooling in spatial frequency domain? So single unit, unit uh, tuned to single spatial frequency is like this. So left spatial frequency, right sp spatial frequency will give you a circular locus of uh, response. If you pool many units tuned to different frequencies, you will do this. So in the end, uh, you have this elongated feature uh, diagonal. So uh, that's sort of a prediction, simplest uh, prediction. And you can do the same thing for orientation as well. So uh, what we did was to use uh, this kind of stimuli. Uh, you see this uh, st spatial frequency changing in the left and right eyes uh, independently. And then we try to exhaust everything. You only see spatial frequency changes, but we actually change the spatial phase as well. Uh, 12 different uh, frequencies, left, right eyes, and then eight different phases for left eye and right eye. So that's a fairly massive experiment, and uh, we like massive experiment. So total of uh, stimuli is like uh, close to 10,000. Okay, so what, what I show here is the, uh, each of these um, is a phase tuning curve. <coughs> So uh, phase means interocular phase, going, through, going from zero to 360 degrees. So that represents, this one represents the disparate tuning essentially uh, for different combination of left frequency, spatial frequency, and right frequency. So it's, it's actually a four-dimensional experiment. 
Now, um, to summarize, we just extract the amplitude of disparity tuning and then plot it as a density plot heat map. So that's this. So uh, it's very elongated and, and it's uh, so, sort of confirming the idea of maybe doing uh, spatial frequency pooling. Uh, but wait a minute. Um, it really, if you're just adding this, you are extending the bandwidth, but you're not really making the making the tuning for spatial frequency really any finer if in the simplest scheme like this. So the, it, it turns out that the, the situation is really more complicated than this. And uh, just to um, talk to you about uh, this, what this means, <laughs> this diagonal feature, um, uh, this means that the left and right stimuli param stimulus parameters really have to be <coughs> matched closely uh, for generating the response from this neuron, okay? So the ideal case or the extreme cases, uh, uh, we require <coughs> left and right parameter to be exactly the same, but that's, that's, you know, can't be really expected from a neuron. Now, <coughs> so um, we turn, uh, it's uh, sort of strange. Um, if you project that map onto the horizontal and right axis, uh, the vertical axis, you get monocular tuning per curve. And if you march across uh, this domain, cutting across this horizontally and vertically, you get binocular uh, spatial frequency tuning curve, which is essentially the matching re requirement for the left and right spatial re frequencies. Uh, this is much narrower than the monocular tuning curve. So it's generating a really narrower matching requirement than the monocular receptive field defined spatial frequency allows. So uh, that's the explanation. Um, if we do spatial frequency tuning, tuning it sharpens binocular disparity tuning. It may be a little unintuitive. Un 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 here are different, uh, three different spatial frequency scales summed um, at uh, three scales. But if you look at the spatial frequency, uh, space uh, receptive field, uh, like the disparity tuning curve, it's, it's the sum of these three, which actually tightens this diagonal dimension, which is the depth dimension. So actually, if you uh, uh, spool in the spatial frequency domain, you would tightening the disparity selectivity in space. So it, it's sort of uh, tightening the opposite domain related by Fourier transform. And the, the opposite happens um, for the spatial pool. If you pull in space uh, like this, extending uh, from bottom left to top right, uh, using three subunits, for example, then uh, you're adding those, and it, of course the, uh, the binocular receptive field is extended, but the consequence of this uh, pooling in space is the tightening of the spatial frequency uh, selectivity matching requirement in the spatial frequency domain. Here again, if you pool in space, you tighten the matching requirement in the frequency domain. So it's, it's kind of complicated, but it's, it's quite interesting. And uh, these two effects actually will add up if you combine the previous two slides. Uh, the top portion is spatial frequency pooling and the bottom is space pooling. Then uh, it, 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 it's even more elongated. And it, it's even more tightened in the disparity domain. All right. So uh, if I summarize that, uh, it's kind of like this. This is the original circular envelope uh, disparity tuning. And if you pool with spatial pooling, then you tighten the uh, spatial disparity selectivity. And uh, if you pool with spatial pooling, then it, of course it extends this diagonally. And that's, I think, we think is the mechanism that we get th this really elongated uh, disparity induction profile in binocular neurons. And that's a summary. Uh, you know, how many neurons have spatial pooling 
and the spatial fre uh, frequency pooling. And it, you notice that the spa degree of spatial pooling tend to be larger, tended to be larger than the degree of spatial frequency tuning, but that, that's the distribution. Okay, um, the, uh, this theory may be a little complicated, but, but this is sort of an intuitive understanding of why this happens. We are talking about spatial pooling of disparity tuned subunits uh, to make this kind of really wide, you know, flat hamburger type uh, uh, receptive field organization. If you try to think that uh, how much tolerance this receptive field will give you as opposed to that one, the plane has to be lying in this red excited area and the tolerance of angle that is allowed is really smaller for this special uh, pooling, uh, pool units. And this uh, slant is actually um, the result of the difference in left and right uh, spatial frequencies. So uh, uh, pooling in space will give you really tighter uh, slant and tilt angle tolerances. And that's really the basis of what, what you actually saw. And the same thing happens for the orientation, but uh, for the sake of time, I just cut, cut those out and the same, same result happens like this. Okay. Now, so the summary of the first section is that uh, um, single energy unit will give you really broad tuning, a binocular tuning, you know, circular tuning for all these things. Uh, for the uh, X position, Y position, left, right, and the spatial frequency, left, right, and orientation, left, right. And if you consider uh, pooling in V1 space, all of these gets tightened. The matching re requirement for the left and right parameters are tightened. Now, <coughs> talk, uh, let's talk about this briefly. Uh, uh, this is mainly the work of uh, Kota and uh, uh, Kurihara. Now, the visual system tries to use these two log units of uh, neurons a dynamic range by spiking by doing light adaptation. This is an old study from uh, uh, Sackman and Kreutzfeld. Uh, they are measuring from retinal ganglion cells and then change the retinal luminance adaptation level and then the response curve shifts along this log luminance axis and that's a faith you know, textbook figure. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, another parameter. That's a retinal ganglion cell, and that's a cortical neuron, my old paper. Uh, here again, the cortical neuron's contrast response function much along, uh, laterally shift along the low contrast axis, uh, like this. And this is called a gain control. I mean, light adaptation is kind of a <coughs> gain control. Uh, with uh, with equation like this, simple equation like this. And uh, you may be wondering about this. I, I just have to remind you that uh, what you saw is the shift along the log contrast axis, but if you actually <coughs> change the uh, horizontal axis to linear axis, it becomes a slope change. And that intu intuitively fits with the gain parameter uh, sitting here. Okay. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> what we did uh, to explore uh, is the cortical neuron is another uh, type of adaptation uh, where the function actually subtracts from the input parameter. The stimuli is a single grating like this. Uh, the contrast level is uh, sometimes flipped uh, and so on, so uh, as described here. That's the base condition. It, the contrast is changing about zero, uh, plus and minus, randomly. And then we add a pedestal of contrast uh, over here. So it's only a positive contrast. So uh, you notice that uh, base 50, uh, that condition is this. Then it goes back to the base zero condition, where the, uh, on average, the phase is inverted. Now, what happens during this period is that uh, uh, is this. Um, the base sequence, actually, the color is kind of uh, mixed together, but if you add the offset, the curve shifts. This is the complex cell 
therefore it, uh, respond similarly to positive contrast, negative contrast, positive, negative meaning the sign of the contrast. Okay, so zero responses uh, for the base condition doesn't generate any response, but uh, as you go to higher contrast, it uh, goes through this uh, uh, squaring uh, operation. But notice that uh, base condition in this uh, pedestal condition is shifted, uh, the bottom of the trough of the curve is shifted here at uh, non-zero contrast to the positive side. And uh, what's strange is that, uh, um, you know, the, the actual contrast doesn't generate, and zero contrast, uh, on the other hand, generate a response. And that's a very strange condition. And what that reminds me was, was is, is that uh, this is really uh, the effect of standing contrast was removed uh, by this adaptation process, which shifts the curve, contrast response curve. Uh, to the right in, in this case. So uh, um, this reminds uh, reminded us of uh, truck saw fading. If you fix it here, then these uh, white and dark blobs will disappear. Does it? Okay. And if I suddenly remove the uh, the stimuli, left stimuli then momentarily you will see the opposite sign blob. And, and the, the thinking is that the, the something is generated, uh, which is the opposite of this thing, and then that cancels the physical stimulus, and then therefore that the visibility disappears. But if you suddenly remove the stimulus, then you'll, you'll all, all, uh, momentarily you get the opposite result. And that's exactly the kind of thing that you see here, you know, the, here the response, the actual stimulus is nullified, uh, causing the cell to respond uh, with nearly zero firing rate. And on the other hand, if you suddenly present zero contrast, then that causes response, and that has to be something that developed uh, based because of failing. And uh, we think that maybe this is sort of a cortical uh, reflection. We're not thinking that uh, it happens in the cortex. It probably happens in the retina, probably, prior to the cortex. But uh, the effect of that is carried into the cortex, and that we are seeing that result in the cortex. But just to show you the uh, uh, more cases, uh, you know, we tried different uh, widths of the contrast uh, modulation, <coughs> and it, it, it shifts um, laterally. Uh, uh, and what we are seeing is this offset uh, of the function. And, and that's a complex cell. And the simple cell doesn't do the full wave, wave rectification. It does a half wave recti rectification. So you get this kind of curve. But regardless, uh, you get this shifting. OK, so let's summarize. What I showed you was, uh, was that uh, pooling in V1 space in this uh, you know, four-dimensional sphere, I mean, uh, it, it, it usually in CNN AI literature, uh, it doesn't do this thing because there's usually no columnar structure. Some of the recent ones have columnar structure. But if you do that, then you, you can really sharpen the tuning. And that's in line with really the stereo acuity, which is at least uh, 10 times better than the visual acuity in terms of ang angular. Uh, <laughs> features. And then the, the visual system seems to use really uh, limited learning range by, by gain changes, changes, and offset changes. So both of these parameters uh, are changed in actual neurons. Okay, uh, I'll close this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments? No? I'm very sorry, it's, it, it's already 6.30 yeah, okay. and, and we, we have to close the, uh, this symposium. Uh, and so the, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, directly talk with uh, Professor Ozawa. Thank you very much. And I will close this.